A very good evening to everyone and a special welcome and good evening to Ed Saltis. Ed, uh, 38 Hobart races, has won the race. Uh, we could call him a veteran, I think, at this stage. He's been a member for over 30 years at the CYC and uh, he shares a very solid surname that's uh, enriched in the DNA of the, Sydney, uh, of the Sydney Hobart and certainly the Cruising Yacht Club. So a bit more of that later. But Ed, now residing in Hobart, how are things in the deep south as we say good evening? Yeah, good evening, Peter, and thanks. Uh, Hobart's great. Uh, I, I love it down here. Um, today's been a bit chilly, I must say. I've got the fire going, as you can see. It's, uh, it, it's been a very hard southwester, and I've, I've got a distant view over the river, over the Derwent, and it's been blowing all day, and I mean really blowing, so it's, it's put on a real, a real stinker. But not much rain, just, just very blowy and uh, a bit chilly, yeah. Well, Ed, before we get into the, the nuts and bolts of it, what's the feeling in, in Hobart Town and, and Tasmania generally about that, the Sydney Hobart race? Is there any any dialogue there at this early stage? Yeah, look, certainly among yachties, it's, uh, it's, it's split, as I imagine it is in Sydney. There, there's some that say, yes, it'll go ahead. We'll all see reason on this. And once we get to 80% vaccinations, it'll open up. And uh, as long as everyone's fully vaxxed on all the boats and even tested before the race, what, what what's the risk really? So... Yes, it should go ahead, but then other yachties are saying, oh, look, it's already September now, and look what's happening in Sydney. It's not getting any better. How do we go from that position to not too many months away doing the race? They're, they're, they're not, so, not so sure it's going to happen. So there's, there's two sides. There's certainly a local population split as well, where some are just saying, don't open the borders, full stop. And I can understand their, their positioning because we're, we're, we're free of it now, but life has to go on, right? And the other side says that the um, Tassie economy is so reliant on tourism that without borders opening up, we, we really are stuffed. So, you know, there's, there's that argument going on as well. So, yeah, who knows? Yeah. Well, let's, let's talk about you and your adventures, I guess. But uh, as I said, uh, the soldier's name, your dad, Bill, was... Uh, uh, joined the club in way back in 1953. He served as treasurer for five years. He was vice commodore, rear commodore, and had two stints as commodore. Mm. Even your mum, Margaret, she was on the roped into the ladies' auxiliary, as was called, <laughs> and, and when your dad was commodore, and now the associates committee. So, and your dad had done so much for the club, I think, in the financial side of things. When the club was a bit rocky a couple of times, they got your dad Bill in to to sort things out. So I think. Um, I'm sure you're very proud of their record at the, mm. Hobart, uh, the mm. CYC. So how did you get involved in sailing? Oh, look, uh, from what you've just said, and I am very proud of both. I, I really had no choice, but loved it from the start, luckily. Um, and from the age of two months, I was in a bassinet being taken out on the boat for a sail to Quarantine Beach on a Sunday and then, and then back home to our house then at Hunters Hill, which was a lovely place to live. <clears throat> um, early days, um, we had an old wooden sabo that Dad bought us. And uh, I remember one time on the Parramatta River, uh, my younger brother and I were in the Sabo. I was only about seven years old or something around there. And Dad just pushed us off and said, you go away, learn how to sail, come back once you've learned how to get back here. And we were scared out of our wits at this thing crying and, oh, it's horrible, don't leave us out here. And he was keeping a close eye on us, of course. But, yeah, he, he stuck to his guns. We had to learn how to tack the boat and get the boat back in without capsizing. So... Yeah, so look, it was a, a fairly early start in Sabos, Manly Juniors. My older brother did Cherubs. I did a bit of Cherubs. Um, but look, because the big boat thing was around, Dad always had big boats. We were into that, some would say, too early, but I certainly loved it. I was, I was like, a, like a pig in poo with the, with the big boat offshore thing. Uh, so doing it through my teens. Uh, school holidays, always September, May school holidays were up to Pitwater on the Lass of Lust, which was an old boat built by Jock Muir down here, the famous Jock Muir, built it of wood, um, hue and pine, et cetera, down, down in Tassie. Then Meltemi, this is the 60s and 70s. And we had some fantastic family holidays up there in uh, uh, Pitwater. Uh, we, we'd always come home on a, a southerly. Dad would somehow <laughs> jag it. We'd have to sail into a southerly coming home from Pitwater. And um, always on the morning of the Pitwater return, there'd be five, you know, five family, the, 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 the three uh, sons, mum and dad. We'd have baked beans for breakfast. And um, lo and behold, off Long Reef somewhere, the three kids are down below spewing up the baked beans like a machine gun coming out and mum's down there with with buckets trying to catch the catch the machine guns as they fire dad's up on deck having a great old time isn't this great margie aren't you enjoying this 
So I, I, I can recall many, uh, many tough stints back that uh, that the old man orchestrated, and uh, Mum was a fairly, a fairly uh, resilient wife, can I say? <laughs> and had his moments as well. But what, what are your early memories of the CYC as a club and uh, going down there, which I'm sure you did probably most weekends? Oh, our whole life was the club. Um, yeah, my, my earliest one was as a, a five-year-old, and this is back, you might be able to recall this better than me, but I was very young, but I think the ground floor of the club was a dingy old wooden locker area for, for sails and anchors and chains, and it was dripping and, and dark, just rows and rows of lockers, I, I can recall this, and Dad didn't want us to go in there, so he said, you go in there, boys, there's there's water rats in there, and they're big guys, real big guys, <laughs> they'll, they'll, they'll eat you for breakfast. So I was always very scared of going into the bottom of the... Uh, bottom of the club um, but that was early on I think soon after that that bottom was all renovated and became a bar and a, a bit of a restaurant I think it's all a bit vague to me um, 10 years old um, the Sunday racing was going on and uh, mum and dad would shuffle us off to a fantastic hamburger joint across the road at uh, Bayswater uh, just next to the old Bayswater pub this this joint did really great Aussie burgers and chips and cokes so mum and dad, so they can stay and drink with their with their mates at the at the club. Shuffle the kids off to off to the Bayswater hamburger joint. We we get across the park and have our hamburger and come back. So yeah. memories of watching the rugby league that was on on, on that oval as we walked across to the the hamburger joint and came back while um while the Sunday activities were going on. This is back in the seventy one. So the Sunday race thing hasn't changed since then. It's always a very popular time. Yeah, that, uh, that, back that, at the club. The only thing that's changed is that the, in your day, the parents had 25 beers, hopped in the car and drove home. <laughs> that's, 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 it's a little bit different these days. That's, that's exactly right, yeah. And that's why they got us off to buy our hamburgers so Dad could have a few beers with his mates. Yeah, but, well, uh, let's, let's, let's talk about the Hobart race and uh, how did you get introduced into that? When did you do your, did you do any delivery trips back first or did you go straight into the race? Oh, look, um, yeah, good point. I, I did a delivery trip back from Ulladulla when I was 16, and that scared the hell out of me. Just Ulladulla was a long way to go. And uh, I'd won Mel Temme uh, with Alan Campbell. He was, you may know Alan Campbell, one of the really old members. He was in charge of the boat. But no, no deliveries back from Hobart. Um, I, I wanted to go when I was 17, and Dad said no. So he was before his time on this 18-year-old limit thing. Uh, it's a very tough race, he said, and I don't want kids to be there, so you have to wait till you're 18. And I was uh, a strapping young lad, fit, and I thought, how dare you not let me go at 17? I was very upset. Uh, but 18 years old, 1979 was the first race, my first race to Hobart on um, Mel Temi, um, an s 45, Dad's boat. Great to be able to do the race with, with my father. He has so many seamanship tips and instincts that, <clears throat> that I, I tried to learn from him and I'm hopefully passing on to my uh, uh, kids as well, but yes, it was a it was a great first race. We we went into ship, uh, Shipwright Arms after the race, and uh, and Dad uh, uh, ordered me a beer in the back bar of the Shippy Arms, and we were toasting each other to a beer. And he said, "Son, now you're a man." And I I was very very proud that my old man, who was a man of few words, said something complimentary towards me. So that was that was nice. It's a tough, a tough way to become a man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I'm, I'm not so sure that doing the Hobart makes you a, a man anyway. But there it is. Uh, certainly in the Salters household, that's uh, that was that was how it was. Yeah, but yeah. a lot of fun. Yeah, well, she was a lovely boat, Mel Temmy, as you say, built in the, the early seventies to the S and S design. But then, did you do any more races with your dad on Mel Temmy after that? Yeah, I did the first three with Mel Temmy. Um, it was a bit. You know, what are we talking? 79, 80, 81. Uh, her heyday was back in the early 70s. So there were modern boats that were killing us on IOR. But look, we were still reasonably competitive and just had a great amount of fun doing it. I, I had a young mate of mine, Sharpie. We did the four deck together. So we, we learned the ropes on, on four deck and Miltemi. And it was a really good three years before branching off. I ended up going, uh, strangely enough, into, into racing with Bob Oakley who uh, originally bought the Ragamuffin of 79 and caught it Wayage in four. Ragamuffin of 79 was part of the team that won the Admiral's Cup in 79, so a, a pretty handy boat. We did two Hobarts with Bob on that, and then I did the 1985 race, I think it was, on the original Wild Oats, which was a latest and greatest FAR 43 ILR design. Uh, 
yeah. with Bob on board. And he was a great, great guy to have on, on board the boat and, and partaking in the race and very, very um, generous to his crew, a, a really nice guy to be around. Absolutely. But I want to take you back to Mel Temi and some of the characters that, that sailed on board in those days. You would have learned a lot both on and off the water from blokes like Billy Wright and Nookie Tyndall and Scruffy O'Neill and Andy Moncrief. I mean, <laughs> you could write a book on each one of those blokes, couldn't you? Oh, they're fantastic guys. Uh, Scruffy and, and Bill I know particularly well. And, and Nookie, and Nookie's passed away now. Eric Tyndall, he was a wallaby yeah. uh, on the side. But, uh, yeah, fantastic guys. And that, they were my heroes. I was a young 10-year-old and, you know, and they were in their prime, whatever they were, 23, 24, and chasing the girls and drinking their beers and uh, ocean racing hard. It was, <laughs> was <That's, laughs> absolutely heroes and all, all of them great, great guys. I ended up buying a boat with Bill, um, Billy Wright, uh, the original Midnight Rambler. It was, uh, was uh, half share. Uh, no, Bob was there too. Anyway, B Billy Wright and I uh, went shares in the boat. So I had the privilege of racing as, as a co-owner with Bill and we did a few Hobarts together and had a, had a huge amount of fun. Yeah. Well, that's probably why your dad didn't let you go to Hobart. You're mixing with those ruffians. <laughs> <laughs> uh, look, there's so many stories I could tell you, but not, not with this audience. No. So maybe I'd better no. leave it be. <laughs> not tonight. But So you, you, you raced then on a great variety of boats. I mean, uh, the, the Wild Oats you're talking about, that the fractional rig, FAR 43. They were all the Vogue then. So you, you know, you went from a big solid masthead boat like Mel Temi, then into the Wild Oats style of boat. So you're progressing and looking, you know, at the sharp end of the fleet. Yeah, look, uh, Wild Oats certainly was. And even on my eyes and four, we had a pretty competent crew. Geetsy was there, Gary Geetsy and a few other pretty good sailors. So we, we sort of held our own. But yeah, we were up, up towards the front. Then I I got married and uh, that often changes your view on ocean racing a bit. So I, so I, so I took a year off, I think. And anyway, long story short, I, I sailed on another on a boat called Revelation, which was a Dubois 40 and um, a boat that was getting a bit contorted. It was in the days when IOR was starting to sort of make boats that weren't that great to sail, but, but rated well. Um, then ended up getting into, I, I bought my own boat with uh, Peter Ward and I made a mine. We, we bought a boat called Nuzulu, which was a Steinman half tonner, uh, yeah. a light displacement Steinman half tonner, with, um, which was very tippy. And we Ed, can, I just, Ed, yeah. can I just interrupt you there? How big a step was that? I mean, you're obviously crewing on good boats, um, you know, so you're obviously in demand. And then how did that step take place? When did you decide, right, I want to be a boat owner? Yeah, look, um, I, I'd grown up seeing my father do it all, all of his years, and I couldn't understand why at first he didn't want to do it. Um, but it just became ingrained. I, I saw the satisfaction he got out of it over the years and being an owner, and, and there's upsides and downsides to it. But I always wanted, from a, a quite an early age, to, in the end, own my own boat. It's all about money in the end, or um, a lot about money. So, But I, I had this feeling that I, I wanted to get my own boat, do my own thing with my own crew and try to take on the best and see how we go, you know, see if we're competitive or not. And did that change your your outlook by, you know, being a crew man where you probably had to buy your lunch and now you're a boat owner, you had to buy everything. <laughs> was yeah. that a... Look, it, it was tough. And we were a bit of a shoestring budget. We had reasonable sales, phrase of sales in the day, but yeah, it was tough. The... Uh, the uh, budget wasn't exactly expansive, but look, we were a bunch of young guys. I was only 28 at the time, I think, from memory when I bought New Zealand. So we were young and fit and uh, 10 foot tall and bulletproof, as they say, back in those days, or, or, or thought we were anyway. Um, we had a ball on New Zealand. We, we won with all of our twice and almost knocked off the Hobart in 91, first in division and seventh overall. The usual thing, we were calmed in Storm Bay, having you know, done very well down to Tasman, but that's, that's plenty of stories like that. But really had a ball on, on New Zealand. It was a tough boat to sail. You had to be, you know, pretty. Uh, it was a it was a wet boat to sail. But we, we had a ball. It was great fun. And did you crew that with mates, or did you? How did you put the crew together for that little boat? Yeah, so it was mates, and that's been a, a thing that my old man did, and that I've done all my life um, is to have mates on board. We we, we don't get paid hands on board with uh, midnight ramblers. Which could be to our detriment, I suppose. We, we we may have lost a few races by not having them, but we've, we've won a few without them, so that makes me fairly satisfied. But back in the day, it was mates, uh, Zuma and uh, oh, Franco, John o. Whitfield, people who were still sailing these days, and just just young guys like me that wanted to get out and have a go. And it was it was a real a real adventure. 
And then after New Zulu, um, what, what came after New Zulu? Yeah, then we bought the Red Rambler, as we called it. It was a burgundy boat. Uh, it was a boat that used to be another concubine, a very well-raced IOR one-tonner. Uh, but IOR had, had died or was dying by then, so we converted it to IMS. But as, as we... Well, it, it was reasonably competitive, but IOR boats were slow versus the latest IMS boats that were coming out. A boat like Assassin was the latest and greatest back then, and she was just chalk and cheese compared to the yeah. IOR hulls. However, we, we had some great racing. We won a few points scores, won a few races, and uh, that was the boat with uh, Billy Wright, which we had yeah. the best, we had the biggest party for two years, that's for sure. We had some <laughs> big parties on uh, Midnight Rambler. And yeah, look, we had really had a ball, but it was the same thing, just mates. Um, my brother Arthur was there, and uh, uh, when I say mates, not just mates off, off, the, you know, off the street, but sailing mates who all yeah. had fairly good um, experience in going offshore. Yeah. Well, I, I, I want to take you now to uh, 1998, which was the Hobart race that everyone will remember for all the, sadly, the wrong reasons with uh, the disaster that um, took over with loss of life and boats being smashed and crews being smashed. And you steered your little boat, 35 footer, to victory. I mean, to win the Hobart race in, in any day and age is a f fabulous effort, but to win in those conditions is extraordinary. And I, I know everyone was in, in awe of the performance, but before I get into the race in detail, just take us through the program up to Boxing Day that is a normal program for you in, in working a boat up. So someone that's listening tonight might just earn a few tips from you, learn a few tips of how you put a boat together and. Sure, we've got COVID now, which changes things quite dramatically, but let's say it was a normal year. How would you approach the year up to Boxing Day? How would you put the boat together? Okay, Peggy, look, it, it, it's all about preparation. Preparation, preparation, preparation. As any serious yachty will tell you, that the race is almost won before the gun starts. That's a bit of a cliche and it's not quite true, but you've got to have the boat so well prepared that uh, I think as Dennis Connors said, no, no excuse to lose. So anything that's not quite right, just eliminate that issue. Now, often that means buying new sails. That could be a budgetary thing, but there's so many little things that you can do on a boat uh, to get it right. And um, I'm renowned for my paper lists. I've got five pages of, of stuff that has to be done and my crew still laughs at me about my, my uh, paper list where I come out with five pages of stuff. Some of it's only tiny things, but little tiny things if they break can, can create bigger things. So... We literally go through everything that, that, that can be checked and, and recheck it, replace it, service it. The obvious stuff like winches, of course, you know, you need to service your winches, blocks. Um, but little little tiny things, um, you know, are, are all the shackles properly done up? Are all the nuts and bolts properly done up? There's been so many times where a shackle pins come undone and something blows up because of it. Um, so stuff that's, frankly, just common sense, but all about preparation of the boat. And I, and I make, I don't make, but I ask and they do it. The whole crew comes and does that with me. So we're all together on, on these big work days. And that creates a real camaraderie. There's, there's no us and them. There's no, you know, steerers and, and build rats. We're all the same. We all do the same jobs. And um, I think it builds a good, a good teamwork ethic, which, which has served us well over the years. Yeah. And would you have worked up doing the winter series and then move into the blue water program? Is that how the lead up would take place for you? Yeah, winter series, yes. Not so much winter series. Although, look, yeah, yes, we do it. But winter series was a time to try to make peace with the with the warring tribes at home with our, with our wives and girlfriends to try to get some brownie points back. So we, 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 we did the... Well, it's a huge amount of fun, the winter series, yes. But really, we did the Blue Water Point Score every year and the Short Ocean Point Score most years in the early days. So we're racing every weekend. And back in the day, the Blue Water Point Score was quite a long a long and onerous, dare I say, point score. So by the time the Hobart came around, the crew was well and truly versed on how to make the boat go in all sorts of conditions and also the strengths and weaknesses of, of, of each of our crew. So we all worked together well and, and, and worked off each other's strengths. Um, so time on the water was, was critical. You know, you, you really can't do the Hobart race without spending a lot of time with the same crew out on the water. It's very important. And would you have had your crew bedded down, like, say, October, November? 
Yes, yes, we did. We, um, I, I don't like the situation where crew gets strung along to the, the last minute doing all the racing and then in December they get cut because someone more uh, uh, experienced or whatever comes in. I, I just don't like that whole situation. So I've, I've always said to the crew, even if you think you're a mug, if, you, if you're picked in June or September and you do all the racing and all the working bees and keep turning up and don't screw up too badly at, at any of those, you're in. We, we aren't going to cut you. Um, and that never happened with with uh, Midnight Rambler. So, again, I think it just created a bit of a team ethic, which I, I believe you need in, in longer races where there's no us and them. We're just all, all together. We're all, we're all the same. And was your crew, did they cover most jobs? I mean, you said no steers and no bowmen. Did everyone, it was a smaller boat, a 35-footer, did everyone do each other's jobs? Oh, no. Look, when I say there, there were particular steerers, two or three of those, there was a bowman. So, no, there were specialist jobs. Um, so if we jibed, we'd have all our jobs, all our, we'd go to our positions and we used to practice a 1,000 jibes before the race, so to speak. So we'd all go to our positions for the jibe. Um, but um, the watches, you know, some people, and I, I maybe I'll be disagreeing with you, but some people allow the steerers more time below because they're so important. And I've tried, we have tried to, and have avoided that to date. I work the same watch system as everyone else, even though I'm a steerer. Um, that means I get tired, but there's no, um, when, when other people are very tired, there's no, this, this thing creeping in, oh, I head down below asleep. I'm so buggered, why can't I get below? That wouldn't happen, but it, it's, it's not allowed to happen because we all, we all work the same amount of time over the race. Yeah. Okay, well, I, I want to take you to, to Boxing Day, 1998. Um, a lot of excitement as always, a Hobart start, nerves, etc. It was a crystal clear day, a building nor'easter, and away we go. So when did you first get inkling that things were not going to be too good ahead of you? Just talk us through the start and the first day, for example. Okay, so the start, a beautiful nor'easter on the harbour, Sydney Harbour, I love it. Picture, postcard, perfect. Building nor'easter. The start was interesting for us. It was a big boat called Nokia that had a prang with um, sort of a Ryan, I believe. We were all luffing up towards the start, feathering up, and Nokia inadvertently tacked onto port, which wasn't a good look because there were boats <laughs> everywhere on starboard coming across. She was only doing half a knot, but the thing's 80 foot long, so there was this big pontoon sitting right in the middle and there was chaos happening. We managed to slip round behind her stern. Uh, we were just in the right spot. So all these other boats on starboard are taking on a port to try to avoid a train. <laughs> and we went around the stern, beautiful clean air and had a had a great start. So we, 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 we got away pretty well. We tacked down the eastern side, if I recall, down the harbour to keep clean air and off the heads with the kite up. Um, we'd just been sponsored by Australian Financial Review. So we had a truck, a, a brand new set of Fraser sails, beautiful kites, beautiful mainsail heads, so brand new kite up, and the boat was flying. We were so excited. She she rates quite low, only a thirty five footer, and we were passing boats that we shouldn't have been passing with with relative ease you know, compared to our handicap. So uh, we were really pumped. It was the first time, frankly, that a boat that I owned was probably on the pace to do you know pretty well in in the race. Uh, the breeze kept building and building, and um, one of the things yeah, was. Yeah. Can I just ask, was, was it tiller steer? It was wheel steered, was it, or tiller steer? No, it was tiller, tiller steer. Okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it was it was a real skiff of the boat. Plenty of people in Melbourne where it came from said it shouldn't be doing the Hobart race because it was too extreme. And she was certainly extreme. There wasn't anything down below, and uh, she, she was an absolute race boat. Um, but also a, a, a dream to sail. Not too many vices, the old girl. It was a Robert Hick design, who's an Aussie, Robert Hick 35. Um, so a great little boat. Um, that, that breeze kept building and building and there was a four, three to four knot, I don't exaggerate, three to four knot current running south that year, which is rare. Often it's two, maybe three, but we had three to yeah. four knots. So we were all flying south. Um, and because the breeze was going the same way as the wind, it was a relative, uh, sorry, the current the same way as the wind, relatively flat sea. So we were just smoking along planing <clears throat> with the um, with a big kite up down off about um, probably Birmingham, maybe. Uh, we had our first big wipeout and the boat got up, took herself and kept going. Then we had a Chinese wipeout about 10 minutes later, which wasn't much fun. Didn't break anything. Luckily, the boat got up and we got the kite down and 
and said, look, that's been two now, so maybe it's time to, this was blowing, I don't know, 35 is gusting up higher, so we're, we're, it's really starting to blow. Uh, so we pulled the headsail out with, with 40 knots blowing, and this was a, a serious 40 knot normally. So we, we arrived in Bass Strait at 11 a.m. on the following morning, which was a record at, at the time for 35 footer. It's pretty quick timing. In these days, not so much, boats are so much faster these days, but back in 98, 98 a 35 footer entering Gaber or passing Gaber, and we were right in close to Gaber at 11 was was, was quite something. <clears throat> um, still running hard, but it was starting to die, and um, there were clouds building up. Um, as as the day progressed, um, there, there were clouds building up down south, uh, and we could tell that there was going to be something pretty nasty happening. We were told it was going to be a bad front in Bass Strait. 30 to 40 knots. And we I said, okay, well, we've been in that before. It's horrible, but you know, we'll, we'll, we'll go for it. Um, the first time we knew that it was going to be 60, 70, 80s was when uh, sort of Orion, the navigator on one of the skeds radioed in saying, guys, I, I know I can't do this because it was against the laws back then, but currently we're getting 67 knots of breeze. It ain't 40 or 67 knots of breeze. We're, we're pulled out. We're getting out of here, and I suggest you do the same, or you know, take whatever action you think is appropriate. So there wasn't really a, a warning until we were well and truly uh, into into Bass Strait that it was going to be horrendous. So, how did you react to that? What did you say? Look, what do you think to the crew, or did you just say let's tough it out, or what was your reaction? Uh, we did talk to the crew, mainly the um, the more senior guys, Bob Thomas, my navigator, fantastic seaman, myself, Arthur, my brother. Everyone had a bit of involvement, so everyone had some buy-in, but they listened to what the three more experienced guys were saying. And, you know, it, it, it was already blowing hard by then for us, and we were fairly well into Bass Strait, 40 miles into Bass Strait, I think, from memory. Um, and it was a real decision, do we, do we turn and run or do we keep going? We didn't know how bad it was going to get, although we had an inkling it was, it was going to be bad. But being in such a small boat, and, and the seas were already horrendous because this four knots of current was smashing into this huge front coming, coming up from the south. So the seas were just standing up. And I really had a concern that if we turned and ran, we'd have been rolled by one of these things, you know, these, these big square waves. Getting back to Eden was... Um, was a, a real temptation, but we said, no, let's let's keep going. The boat's in good nick. We've got a crew that we all rely on. Let, let's keep going. But there was certainly, you know, what, what do we do? Should we run for cover? We said no. Yeah. Well, the conditions obviously deteriorated. So what did you do with watches, sail combination, um, food? How did you get through the next night? Yeah, so we, we had a very aggressive watch system on initially where it was, uh, I think, five, only two down, seven crew, two down, the rest were up. Uh, four hours on, two hours off, so fairly aggressive racing watch system. That changed as we approached Bass Strait because we knew it was going to be a hard blow. So we changed to a more traditional watch where it was one floating, three off, three on. So you're down below for three hours, up on deck for three hours. Uh, which was the watch system I did when I first did Halo on, on Mel Temi. Um, then we changed again, and my brother Arthur was instrumental in this because I was just too busy sailing the boat and trying to keep it under control. There, there were people not getting enough time below. It, it was pretty extreme on deck. So we changed the two up, um, five down. Um, only two guys on deck, and uh, one of those was sitting on the rail looking forward into this maelstrom that was coming and, and and water in his eyes like someone poking forks into his eyes his job was to pick out the big waves and the guy that was steering the tiller was crouched in behind him getting some cover from the guy sitting on the rail and when he yell out top of his voice because you couldn't hear a thing there was so much noise happening top of his voice big wave you'd peek out behind the guy get a, a chance before the the pain in your eyes got too much right it's breaking there, it's not breaking there. I'm going to try to take this approach and get up over it. So there were just two on deck. The rest were down below. Now, part of that was uh, if worse came to worse and we got rolled or, 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 or semi-rolled, the worst thing could be there's only two guys in the water with their harnesses on still attached to the boat, hopefully. So it was, was more about keeping people on deck to a minimum given, given the extreme conditions that were out there. And did you go to survival mode or did you go we were race mode the whole time? Oh, no, look, um, 
Yeah, people were, short answer is we were in survival mode. So as it turned out, the breeze was west southwest, and we found out the best angle to take on the breeze was at a 60 degree wind angle. So up and over the waves, up and then um, pull away to get to, to get over them at a, at a 60 degree wind angle. And if you do the calcs on that, 60 degrees is getting you down towards about 160, 170 compass bearing. So we were still going south, pretty much going south, but only because we had a 60 degree angle to these monstrous waves coming through. If that had meant we, we could sail north, we'd have sailed north, we'd have sailed west, whatever angle kept us at 60 degrees to these waves, we, we believe was our best chance of survival. We get up and over the waves at 60 degrees, gives you enough power to get over them. You aren't slamming too much. So we were still going south, but it was purely survival mode for about 10 hours. And what sails did you have, have up? Yeah, look, we had the trisail and storm sail, far too much sail area. The boat was getting laid flat. That's how hard it was. Uh, we then tried just the trisail up, which would be the more traditional way to go, you would think. Um, but I was steering a lot, a lot of the time when I had the tiller up underneath my with my chin trying to keep the boat from, from rounding up. We were getting laid flat and rounding up. And you don't want to be fighting the boat in those conditions. It's bad enough as it is. So you, you want the boat and you to be working together. So something had to change. The only other choice we had was storm sail up and no trisail. So we did that. The crew was fantastic in these conditions to make all this happen. Um, and then we sailed with, with, the, with the storm sail for about well, probably close to 10 hours, and it, it did work. I know it sounds anti-intuitive, too much sail area forward. You'll have lee helm. We were leaning over so much, so that created, I believe, weather, just because we were on our, on our ears so much, we, we were getting weather helm to offset the lee helm. Anyway, bottom line is boats are different, but this boat anyway was neutral helm, a bit of weather, touch of lee, but mainly just a bit of weather helm. So pretty much nice and easy to steer on the 60-degree angle, with just the storm cellar. Yeah, well, I think a lot of the iconic photos of the of you in Bass Strait showed you just with a little storm jib up and one guy sitting on sitting on the rail, <laughs> the wave spotter. There I did. The wave spotter. <laughs> yeah, it was a tough, tough call for uh, Gordo. Did a lot of that. Gordo, anyway, they, all, all the crew took their turns. And it wasn't much fun, but that was our process, and uh, yeah, it it, it worked. And, and it's amazing how. How small you think a storm sail is when you set it in the docks, but it was a bloody huge sail when we're halfway across Pastro. <laughs> I guess down below was like any boat in a blow, it was water everywhere and things everywhere and trying you're to getting get something a lot to eat. Of... Yeah. Yeah. yeah, water ingress was bad. Um, the boat was, look, just opening up the hatch, you get it, gallons of water coming through and you had to open the hatch to get people out of down below. Uh, a lot of water down below, yes. Um, but Bob again was superb, my co-owner, navigator, great seaman. He was doing all the, the hard yakking and sponging the bilges and getting the buckets out over the side. And people were spewing down below, so he'd be trying to attend to them and, and keep them as comfortable as possible. Um, you, you, you asked about food. There was we really didn't eat anything and probably should have, but we were so just busy trying to survive that it wasn't on our minds to eat something. But thankfully, we did drink water. And that's the biggest thing that can that can really hurt you in uh, in long ocean racing is, is dehydration. And uh, all the crew, Mix and Arthur especially, kept pumping water into us, especially the steerers, uh, to keep the, keep the hydration up. We, we didn't feel like drinking because we were cold. We had all our layers of clothing on. But because you're working so hard, especially steering the boat, you can dehydrate quite quickly. So we did thankfully have plenty of water. And... Let's face it, you, you can last for days without food, but you can't really last for days without water. Yeah. When did you realise that you were in for a chance to, to win the race? When did, when did that sort of start triggering into your system that, hang on, boys, if we can hang in here, we're, we're half a chance? Uh, yeah, down the coast of Taz, off around, um, off about Bishano, I'd say. Our HF radio went on the blink. Um, it doesn't like water, HF radios, and there was a lot of water down below. The GPS, there was not, we had nothing. B&G was gone, GPS was gone, HF was gone. So we had nothing but our compasses to steer by for all this time. And Bob did an amazing job. He, he, he DR dead reckoned, from, dead, dead reckoned from pretty much Gabo Island to Bishano. He was only out by about four miles. So this is sailing through this horrendous gale. And his DR, when we finally sighted land, he was only four miles out. So that's, that's not a bad job. 
Um, but uh, we um, hadn't heard anything and, uh, and finally got the VHF happening. Then the HF was dried out enough and started working. Anyway, bottom line was we had the skid off around Bishina and uh, we heard where we were and we heard the boats that were uh, the hot favourites, the Ragamuffins, the Quests, um, Osmaid, uh, Atara, who have I missed? Some other really good boats. Assassin was there. Brinda Bella, Sayonara were the big boats who had done very well. But all these guys, we had them on handicap. We, we knew that we had them on handicap. Um, we'd stayed relatively close to rum line while still going 160, 170s. We were still relatively close to rum line, whereas other boats had gone way out to sea. I can understand why they were just running off and trying to get away from this horrible thing. But the low itself was moving out to sea. So uh, in the end, some of these guys actually copped more bad stuff, I, I would imagine, by going that way. Whereas we, we didn't get through it fast, but probably faster than some of the boats. Um, anyway, so I, I, I digress. We, we heard on the radio, we got a chance, and I instantly said, right, get the full main up. We had a reef in the main and the four up or something. The breeze was gradually dying. Get the full moon up, big head, so everyone on the rail, we're going to go for this. And, and uh, as usual, I was, I was made to calm down, calm down, Ed, calm down. Don't, don't break the boat now. Let's, let's just get her home. We haven't got to go too hard. But it was a hugely exhilarating thing on this race that we've all been trying to win our family for so long to we really had a shot if we could just get this boat home. It's often difficult, and you alluded to it before, that if you go through a blow or in a blow, it's always you're a little hesitant to to put sail back up. You're a bit relieved that it's it's over. And, you know, the, uh, our friend Peter Kurtz always said, you know, you've got to start putting the sail back up as quick as you can. How difficult did you find that to, to start pushing the boat again after you'd sort of survived? The worst was over. Yeah, look, it, it, it did take some doing because we were licking our wounds. We all had injuries and bruises and bumps. Uh, one guy, Chris Rockle, had a bad cut across his head. He was thrown across the cabin and landed on his head anyway. Long story short, there was blood everywhere, so he was concussed. And so we, we had issues about going hard. But to be fair, I think in hindsight, we did probably change gears up faster than most, I, I believe. Even before we heard that we were winning the race, we, we were still racing, as I say, with a reef in the main and a four up in you know, still pretty brisk weather. So we, we, we did change up reasonably quickly, but probably in hindsight, we could have gone even faster. <laughs> we were certainly battling and bruised, so maybe not quite fast enough. And what was your trip around Tasman and across the bay like and up the river? Oh, look, um, we had light uh, westerlies, west southwesters down from Bishano down, getting lighter and lighter. Then, thankfully, a little mini front came through. It wasn't a bad one, but just around Tasman, just before Tasman Island, a southwester came through, 15 to 20 knots, so a fairly mild one. Um, so we got down, reached down to Tassie, and then we were tacking um, into about 15 to 20 knots. And I'll never forget the, the two boats that rounded Tasman Light with us. I just can't believe this to this day were Quest and Industrial Quest. So Quest is a Nelson Marrick 46, latest and greatest, um, with all the fantastic sailors on it, you know, Greeny and all these guys. Uh, Industrial Quest was the old Quest, which is a Nelson Marrick 43, equally beautiful boat. And both these guys were with us off the stick as we they, they went through us straight away and, and, and beat us off, you know, beat us home by a bit. But that was a huge privilege to see those boats as we rounded Tasman Island. Yeah. Um, going from there, it got um, uh, less and less. It was a quick front that came through. Getting in through the iron pot, we were tacking backwards and forwards. We had no wind gear. It was night time. We finished at, uh, I think, 4.50 in the morning. So it's night time getting in there. Uh, the, the river was closing down, as it always does, and we were thinking, God, after the hell we've been through, we're going to lose this race because there's no breeze. Uh, and it was very tough on the river. It was coming and going, but there was enough of the southerly left that we had a gust, then nothing, a gust, then nothing, uh, pushed up past White Rock and then tacked over in towards Sandy Bay. And very heated discussion on, on the boat about which way we should go. We were all a bit tired and uh, emotional by then, but... Um, we, we had just enough puffs to get us home uh, by 4.50 or around there somewhere and won the race by about two and a half hours. So yeah. it, it was it was a lot in the end, but at, at, the, at the time, it didn't feel like a lot. Yeah, it was a, a very, very famous victory. But, you know, it was tinged, of course, with sadness because of the loss of life and 
But uh, as I said, a, a tremendous credit to you and your crew. So what lessons did you learn out of that, Ed? What, what, what did you take away from that whole race? Oh, look, uh, to, uh, as if I didn't need convincing, because my old man used to bash it into me, but all, 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 not bash it into me, literally, but always respect the sea, always respect the sea. The, uh, the sea's in charge, you're, you're, you're never in charge of the ocean. Huey, the god of the wind, has total control and don't ever think that you've got a better hand than Huey. It just made me double respect that fact that, that, that you're only there because Huey's allowing you to be there. And don't go to sea if you aren't properly prepared with the right crew. Don't take things for granted because Huey has a way of finding out those that take things for granted. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Look, the other thing is safety. We, the safety in those days, albeit best of breed at that time in the world, we were better than the UK and faster at that time. But it's come so far since then. And the safety we had or didn't have was... You know, we, we were, and on that little boat in New Zealand, the half tonner, we did crazy stuff across Bass Strait that you know, I, I can't believe I'm still here, frankly. So <laughs> we, we, can, we can laugh about it, but, you know, certainly we were taking risks that we probably shouldn't be taking then. And the uh, safety ramped up a lot since 98, has been doing it ever since. And I think that's a good thing um, because, yeah, it's a, it's a risky sport. Did you ever think, oh, that's it? Oh, that'll, that's my last Hobart? You obviously didn't because you're still doing it. But <laughs> did that ever uh, cross your mind that, you know, enough's enough and you roll yeah. the dice? No, Peter, I did. For the first four months after that race, I, I did think that's it. I had a lovely wife, Sue, and three, uh, two kids back then, two and four years old. I think they were two young boys. And I, I thought, this is crazy. Why, why go out and risk your life when you've got such a fantastic family happening? Uh, but then the old uh, <laughs> the old salt in the veins got me going again, and uh, by about June, I'd uh, uh, convinced the wife and, and the crew that we'd do it again. So you know, back for '99, which was a very tough year. In fact, '99, very tough year for small boats. The, the the big boats got in, and we got an absolutely horrendous suddenly change off about St Helens somewhere. Right. Yeah. So where to? Then you progressed into another midnight ramblers. You've had a few of them since then, haven't you? Yes, yeah, it's a, <clears throat> pardon me, um, six Midnight Ramblers um, and Nizulu and Chameleon, so eight boats in all, but, but six Midnight Ramblers. Um, we had a Judson 36 after that, uh, then a Far 41 design, which uh, Billy Wright told me I was mad to go outside the heads in, let alone go to Hobart in. <laughs> and he was probably right because our first race, so that, that picture behind you was Love and War in the 2004 race. We did the 2004 race on this Far 40 without changing anything on it. And we, we pulled out when the boat was breaking up um, halfway into Bass Strait. It was a very tough year, as you will recall. And um, Far 40s without changes in those sort of conditions, we're talking, I don't know, 35, 40 knots, was it, southwest in uh, yeah. in uh, Bass Strait? We were, we were going sideways more than forwards. No matter what we tried to do, we were going sideways more than forwards. Uh, and bulkheads were breaking. So anyway, I, I digress. After that, we, we changed her a lot. We put a new keel on it, a new bulb keel, strengthened the bows up, strengthened the stern up, made it a more seaworthy boat, and did five hobarts on her. And she was a great boat, the old girl. We really... Well, we won Southport on it. We won Lord Howe Island on it. Um, Blue Water Point score on her. So I did some good things with her. Uh, Curve 40 after that. Curve 40 Midnight Rambler, which was a lot of fun. That thing downwind was just uh, a dream to sail with its big assy kites and uh, amazing off, off the breeze. And like the TPs all do it these days, they're just up and going so fast. Uh, she was one of the first, apart from Schutzbar, one of the first 40 footers in Australia to really... Um, you know, push the envelope in terms of downwind performance. So that was a lot of fun. And now my current boat is a Sydney 36 uh, Midnight Rambler. So it's more of a cruiser racer, uh, but she's doing okay. So I'm, I'm still caught up in racing on her. I, I, I can't escape. So the Hobart for this year, that's part of the schedule? Yes, yes. I've got a full Tassie crew now who have, who have worked out really well. Great mix of youth and uh, experience and... Uh, uh, it's pretty tough sailing down here. So one, one thing I found that it, even the bad sailors in Hobart are pretty good sailors compared to the rest of Australia. It's, <laughs> it's just a tough place to sail. It's uh, either there's no breeze or it's blowing dogs off chains. So a great crew. Um, we, we've, we've had some good results down here in point scores and we managed to win the Mariah Island race last two years ago. It was first overall in Mariah Island, which has been a race that I've always uh, sort of uh, 
uh, respected, I suppose, because you have to pass yeah. Cape Rao and Tasman Island twice. Any racer does that, you're, you're asking for trouble. <laughs> um, so to win that was great. Uh, but yes, we're looking at doing the race this year. I just hope it's on, um, but we want to get up there and um, uh, assuming it's going to be on and let's you know cross our fingers, it, it happens. Yeah. Well, Ed, look, you're 38 Hobart races and uh, your first back in 1979, I think you said. You, you've, how have you seen ocean racing change and where, where do you see it sitting now? Oh, look, it's changed a lot over the years and you, you can't stop progress. One comment I'd make is that the camaraderie in Hobart isn't the same as what it used to be. Crews still get together, but crews don't mix with, with other crews quite as much, I, I found at least. Uh, maybe it's a Constitution dock thing where we all used to get into Constitution dock and it was just a big party happening there. But it, it, the, the, the average mug can't find it much harder to do the Hobart race on his own boat. Than, you, than he used to be able to. And that's a shame. So just having a bike that's a pretty good sailor with his mates going to the Hobart, that can't, it doesn't happen so much because of the cost, the time and the safety hoops you've got to jump through. All of them very valid safety hoops. I'm not criticising where it's gone, but just a just a, 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 a unfortunate byproduct of that is that it's cut out quite a few of the sailors that I used to enjoy racing against back in the day, back in the 70s and 80s. Um, look, canning keels and motorboats, it's a motor winch boats, it's a well, uh, well-known fact that I'm against them. Not against them per se, but winning Tattersall's Cup. They can do light on us, but I don't think, and I've always kept to this, kept my guns on this, they, they shouldn't be allowed to do Tattersall's Cup because their advantages are just so great. Um, but that's progress. Um, how do you stop progress? You, you really can't. It hasn't hurt the race um, to a huge extent. It's still a, a great race. There's still plenty of boats outside of the Candy Keels and motorised boats that are, that, are, that are competitive. And indeed, the TP52s these days have become very, very competitive. So, look, uh, I, I, I think it's still in good shape, the Hobart. It's, it's still got that, that, that great um, feeling ethos to it that still draws me and draws plenty of others. It's it stood the stood the times and stood the changes pretty well. Um, the CYC has done a great job in, in managing how to progress through the different changes that have happened and, and rules, the handicap rules are always contentious. Um, so short story, it was great back then, but it's it's still pretty good fun now. Yeah, I think you alluded to that a lot of the, the camaraderie has disappeared because everyone gets to the dock and on the plane home. But, you know, you look back and the, some of the characters that have come through the race, I mean, you go back to Don Mickleborough, which we, we can just remember, and those sort of blokes. You, you would have run into some good characters. Uh, some great characters, great, great, great stories. Uh, one, one, in fact, you know, of, of Peter Kurtz, who has always been my hero, and the boats he used to run, Madeline's Daughter, Drake's Prayer, Once More Dear Friends, Love and War. All these boats were fantastic boats, great campaigns. But uh, Kirtsey, Peter Kurtz did the 1971 Hobart with my father on Mill Temi. He was navigator on Mill Temi. And um, Kirtsey down at Hobart had a few drinks. They all had. He wasn't on his own. They, they all had a few drinks. And there was a constable there from the local police force who took objection to Kirtsey yes. drinking a can of beer while he was walking from a pub to a boat or a boat to a boat. There was a public place he couldn't drink. And he said, sir, put that can down straight away and back to your boat. You mustn't be drinking on these premises. And um, Peter turned around. I wasn't there, but I'm told he said something like, oh, you're a, you're a mug and you're a cat. And, and the policeman said, oh, that's, that, you can't talk to me like that. And uh, he put that beer down right away. And Kirsty said, I repeat, you're a mug and you're a cat. So he was marched off to jail. And uh, chucked into the clinger overnight was was um, was uh, Peter Kurtz, uh, the, the 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 great Peter Kurtz. And uh, the next morning, Dad had to go and bail him out as as the owner of the boat he was on. So Dad turned up at the at the local police station and bailed out Kurtzy. And I wasn't there again, but I'm told that Kurtzy was too ready to give these guys a um, gob full of, uh, of 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 his view of them. So Dad it was, was drinking no, very fast before he could make things any worse. He was no he was no fan of officialdom, that's for sure. <laughs> no, no, he, he wasn't. And a, and a truly yeah. great man. I was lucky enough to do a Lord Howe Island race with him many years. Uh, 2010, I think one of the last he did. And that was great to be invited on Love and War and to do the race with the guy that I had so much respect for was 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 fantastic. But yeah. yes, quite a quite a character. Yeah. Looking outside the the Hobart race for a moment, what about a, a, like the America's Cup? What, what are your feelings on the on the cup? 
Oh, look, it's great to watch. It's exciting. Um, gets your average punter in, I suppose, seeing these boats buzzing around so fast. Uh, I'm a bit of a traditionalist, so while it's exciting, I, I, I can see why it's happened. I don't disagree with it, but am I really passionately behind it? Not so much to tell you the truth. Yeah. If you want the honest truth, I, uh, it's, a, it's a spectacle. Um, uh, but it's got less to do with sailing and more to do with a bunch of other stuff than it, it ever had, I, I believe. The fast net race has just concluded in England. Um, that had a very wide mixture of yachts from that hundred or the Swan 125 to the Amokas foiling boats and the class 40s and the two handers was a big mixture they have over there at the ROIC. And for the first time, it finished in Cherbourg in France. Did you keep an eye on all of that? Very close eye, Peter. Yeah, and it was a, a great race and gives me courage and maybe the Hobart race can happen. If the fast it can happen, maybe maybe the Hobart can. Uh, but yeah, keep a close look. It, it's a fantastic race. They've gone down a different path to the CYC. They've allowed all the boats in, the cats and everything runs in. Um, overall, I believe is less of a um, prize these days, dare I say, than it used to be. When Ragamuffin won the fast race in 1970, it was Bigger than Ben Hur here in Australia, it was just a great thing to see a little, not a little boat, but a boat from Sydney win overall. These days it's less. Starts are over six hours. There's uh, mockers that fly off on their foils and the cats. And so, look, who's right? Who's wrong? I, I like the Hobart as it is to tell you the truth, but I'll be accused of being a, a luddite and not, <laughs> not uh, uh, embracing the future enough when I when I say that. But you, you have to embrace change, but you you also need to be aware of tradition while you're embracing change and that's a very tough gig sometimes to get it right yeah yeah but there, there certainly was a mixture of boats as you say multi hulls and mono hulls and massive mono mono hulls and two handers <laughs> flying around everywhere and in a very brisk start it was, it was a good spectacle yes yeah the, the uh, two handers interest me a lot there's some fantastic french two handers out there using auto helm it's all allowed over there, and geez, they're very competitive boats. I've had a bit of racing with some of them down, one of them down here, a, a French boat, and and they're very quick boats. Um, I, I'm I'm for two-handed sailing. In, in fact, uh, Tom Barker, who's a board member uh, on the CYC now, and I was seriously contemplating uh, a few years ago taking my Sydney 36 to Hobart in the in the uh, inaugural two-handed event. So we were, I, I was seriously considering considering it and may still sail two-handed one day. It really has a, a great, uh, it's got a lot going for it. I think it's just a simple, a more simplistic way to go to sea uh, as long as your mate and you are, are up to it. So I, I'm, I'm for it, um, but how you bring it in fairly, it's, it's got its issues. And there's two very strong sides to that argument. And probably the biggest thing that I'm, um, uh, frustrated or disappointed by is, is how it's become personal and there's a lot of um, arguments going on now where the, where, where, where the man is being played rather than the ball and that's a shame for, for our sport. Um, I don't know who's right, who's wrong, but there's just a lot of aggro going on right now and that's a bit of a pity. Well, it's not too late. You haven't put your entry in for the Hobart. You'd still do <laughs> it. Uh, mate, I'm, I'm not getting any younger and uh, to, to, to be fair, the Sydney 36 would need some work done. She's a beautiful sea boat, but you need some work done to make it into a proper two-handed boat. Yeah. And uh, I, I have to cut out some of my crew from Tassie who all deserve a run, so I, I need to look after them as well. Yeah. All right, Ed. Well, look, thank you very much. It's really been insightful. And as I say, I think your victory in the 98 Hobart race was, was, was heavily respected by everyone. Far thank and wide. I mean, it was, a, it was a, a wonderful performance. And I remember talking to your dad at the time or sometime after he, he was with two sons out there he was more worried than your mother because I think he'd been out there and realized what it could be like and your mum was fairly calm but anyway you survived it it was a great win so let's hope that the race is on for Hobart and uh, we look certainly look forward to seeing you here and as I say your your father certainly has put so much into the CYC and I think the club are really indebted to what he's done and uh, we wish him well and we certainly wish you well. And uh, as I say, look forward to seeing you at Christmas time. Oh, thank you, Peter, for those kind words. Uh, they uh, mean a lot to me and my family. And yes, I'm hoping to have a beer with you at the CYC this coming December. Okay, your shout. Okay. I'll do that. <laughs> Good night, Ed. All the best. Okay. Good night. Good night, everyone. Thank you very much.